The story happened when I was around 11 or 12 years old and I was finally on summer break. Me and my best friend, whom I met on the internet, made plans for me to stay at her place for a week. She lived in a city about two and a half hours away from me, but I've met her before in real life, so everything was fine. On that day, I took the train by myself, which was not a new experience for me since my mom let me have a lot of freedom and experience. I texted my friend the time and place I'd arrive, but that city was huge, so I got the name of the station mixed up, which led to her going somewhere else instead of where I was. But at the time, I obviously didn't know, so when I arrived, I just took my suitcase and went to a quiet corner to wait for her while watching all the busy people running from A to B. My friend texted me, asking me where I was, and after some more texts, we figured out that it was my fault for telling her the wrong station, but she was on the way to pick me up. After waiting for a few minutes, a man in his 30s accidentally bumped into me, even though I was just standing still, and apologized a thousand times. I assured him it was fine and nothing happened, but he insisted on making it up to me and wanted to buy me a hot chocolate or something to eat. I refused, but I was also a pretty shy girl back then and wasn't taken seriously many times. He seemed pretty frustrated at this point and decided to just grab my hand and try to drag me with him, and only then I realized what his intentions were and felt super scared. No one else around me seemed to notice what was going on, but like a miracle, my friend just arrived on time and came straight to me. I was calling her name, which made the guy realize I wasn't alone anymore, so he took off as fast as he could without saying anything. I have no idea where I would be if my friend didn't show up that day, and I hope I never meet the man who tried to kidnap me at a train station. This happened around six years ago. My ex and I were visiting England, and we ended up getting lost in a not-so-savory part of town, and it was getting late. This was before Uber, and we couldn't even find a taxi cab. We decided to wait for the next train, and ended up finding out from a nice homeless guy which train to take. However, we had a good 30-minute wait for the train. My ex decided he had to use the restroom, so I stood outside while he used it. The station was completely deserted, save one person. At first, I couldn't decipher if it was a woman or a man. However, upon closer inspection, it became clear it was a woman, probably in her mid to late 40s, except she had that hard look about her. She was wearing men's combat boots, jeans that were tied with what looked like rope, and a man's flannel shirt. She was skinny, greasy hair under a knit cap, and she was twitchy. My ex and I were used to seeing junkies as we both had grown up in California, and our home city had its fair share of tweakers and junkies. Anyway, she sat there occasionally mumbling to herself, but we didn't pay her any mind. Mostly, we passed the time by playing with a deck of cards I had in my purse. The train pulls up so we get on. It's pretty empty, and we have our choice of seats. Of course, she sits right in front of us, even though there were rows of seats. We settle into our seats as we have 12 stops before we can get off. Meanwhile, she turns to us and starts cackling. She barely had any teeth and the combination between that and her heavy cockney accent made it pretty hard to understand, but she starts telling my ex that she would give him a proper jobby if he'd give her some money. Now at the time, we weren't on British slang and both of us were like, you'll give him a job? And my ex is telling her he doesn't need a job. She's getting worked up and the conductor tells her she better be quiet or he will toss her off again. So she mutters that he can screw right off under her breath and starts mumbling. It was hard to catch, but she called me a slag and some not-so-nice names. Thankfully, we were back in the city proper and our stop was coming up. We signaled to the conductor we wanted off, and when the train pulled up to the stop, we get out. And so does our friend. My ex tells me that we will go grab dinner as we were both starving, and we head for a pub not too far from our hotel we had seen the night before. Meanwhile, she's behind us. She starts taunting us, and I get a little worried as obviously the sister is off her rocker. We make a run for it and get lost in a crowd. We think that's the end of it and go to eat in the pub. We come out of the pub about an hour later and head up the block to our hotel when we hear, That's them! We turn, and our friend along with two other rough-looking characters are coming up the sidewalk and we book it for our hotel, which after a rich pub meal isn't easy and luckily once we get inside, the doorman shoes them away. Thankfully, we didn't 
see them again. I'm a very small, weak woman, 5'6 and 118 pounds. I'm a university student who lives with my mom. I take my city's subway system to and from school, and I've never had any problems with it before. On Mondays and Wednesdays, I have a class that ends at 7.15. I've never been concerned about it because the route from my classroom to the train station goes through a segment of downtown that is filled with high-class hotels, so it's very well lit and there's always police around, not to mention that a lot of my classmates also ride the train and take the same route. But yesterday, I had to go to the bathroom after class, so by the time I got to the train station, all of my classmates had already left on their own trains. Part of me thinks, if I had just held it, my night would have gone so much better. I got to the train station and sat down on the bench to wait. I have these huge, over-ear Bluetooth headphones, the kind that are also an accessory. Yesterday, I was just using them as earmuffs. I didn't have any music playing. But these are quality headphones, so outside sound is still pretty muffled even with them off. So I was sitting there with my headphones on, playing Pokemon on my 3DS, with a bald man at the other end of the bench. Some guy walks up and wants to sit between us, so I scoot over without being asked because that's just what you do. New guy starts talking to bald guy. I can't hear what they're saying because of the headphones. Then new guy turns and gives me this friendly pat on the back and says something to me. I pulled my headphones off one ear because I thought he wanted something. This guy just kind of babbles at me. I couldn't really understand what he was saying because I don't hear very well in the first place. Not enough to need aids, but enough that I talk loudly and a normal speaking voice sounds quiet to me. My standard thing for when this happens is to ask them to repeat themselves, or just kind of smile and nod, which is what I did. Then he finally speaks up more and asks my name, holds out his hand to shake. I say my name and go to shake his hand. Instead of shaking it, he pulls it up and kisses the back. That was when I knew that things weren't right. He starts asking me about myself. First how old I am, then if I drink alcohol, then about my game and the progress Nintendo has made since putting it out, old game. He goes on about alcohol for a while, asking how much I drink and talking about how much he drinks. The whole time he's sitting so close and leaning over me, speaking very fast and in something between a mumble and a normal speaking voice. I was really uncomfortable, and over this guy's head I was giving panic looks at bald guy. I knew he saw those looks, he would meet my eyes and then look away. Creepy guy asked me more stuff about what train stop I go to and where I live, which I avoid answering. He mentions that he needs to get off one stop after Uptown Station, which is the station I need to get off at. For info, we're at Downtown Station. I live along the train line and you can see my condo from Uptown Station, like literally, it's at the end of the road that Uptown Station is on in a T formation. Between Downtown Station and Uptown Station there are five other stations. My train comes and I quickly go, well, this is my train, bye sir, and get away from him and onto the train. I remember fervently hoping he wouldn't follow me. He didn't follow at first so I didn't think he would be getting on the train. So I sat down in a completely empty seat and put my bag on the seat next to me. The train has benches with two seats on each bench. If I had known that he would be getting on the train, I would have sat down next to one of the women on there and pretended that I knew her. Creepy guy got on right before the train left. Before he did, bald guy who had sat down in front of me smiled at me and said, Don't worry, he's a weirdo, but he's harmless. I cannot tell you how angry I was about this idiot. Creepy guy may have been harmless to him, but I was terrified and looked to him for help multiple times throughout the train ride, and this bald-headed idiot would look me in the eye, acknowledge my fear, then look away and make conversation with other men on the train. Screw this guy, I hope he trips over and falls face first into a cactus. Now this next part, I don't really have an explanation for. I know that this was dumb, but it's like I froze up and my southern bred manners kicked in. The guy came into the train and started looking around for me. I froze and thought, oh crap. He spotted me, walked up and said, hey, can I sit next to you? I wanted to say no so badly but I couldn't speak and my body just went into autopilot and moved my bag off the seat and onto my lap. I was trapped between him and the wall of the train. 
His entire body was just pressed up against me. There wasn't an inch of him that wasn't pressed against my side. I was just kind of frozen, facing straight forward and staring at my game. When he talked, he did it with our cheeks only an inch apart. He started mumbling and chattering at me again. I could barely understand him. He asked me about my game again, then got into weirder topics. He asked me if I listened to rap music, then congratulated me for saying no. Asked if I dated black guys, if I had a boyfriend, if I had a girlfriend. He asked if I lived alone, where I lived. I lied, obviously. As we got closer and closer to my stop, I got more and more afraid. I was so scared he was going to follow me home. It's a straight shot from the station of my condo. You literally can't miss it. I was giving panic eyes to everyone in there. Men, women, out the window, anyone who would look at me. They all looked away, and creepy guys saw me give the looks multiple times. It's just kind of confirmation to me that he had bad intentions. If a normal, albeit weird guy who was trying to make conversation with a girl saw her making panic eyes to people, they would realize something was up and that they were being creepy. But this guy just didn't care. I don't know how I can properly express how terrified I was. It all looks so clinical and factual written down, but this felt like life and death to me. He pulled dozens of folded up papers out of his pocket and started sorting through them. He picked one and started writing on it all the while mumble chattering about racist Chinese ladies and racist bald guy. Meanwhile, my stop was coming up and I was still panicking. My stop comes and I stand up. He had his legs up so I couldn't get out. I very forcefully say, Sir, this is my stop, I need to go. And he scrambles up out of the way. A billion more papers, a folded up notebook and an unopened condom packet fell out of his pockets. I get to the door, the train comes to a stop and my fears are proven true. He gathers up all of his stuff and follows me out. Remember that he said the stop he needed was the one after the stop I get off at. I manage to text one hand in my pocket and send help, man follow, uptown station to my mom. She doesn't reply. I manage to turn on my headphones and connect them to my phone, again one handed in my pocket and call her. She doesn't reply. I'm nearly hyperventilating. I try to move fast enough to lose this guy since he's dropping the collection of stuff everywhere, but he gets himself organized and catches up to me before I reach the escalators. I've been continually calling my mom this whole time. Creepy guy follows me up the escalator and out of the gates. At this point, I stop. There is literally no way I was going to go home and show this guy where I lived. He asked me which way I was going next. I sort of lied and said that I was waiting for my mom to come pick me up. He said that they would wait with me. I tried to convince him that it would be okay for him to leave and he insisted on staying. At this point, I pulled my phone out and was calling my mom publicly. He leans in super close again and goes, Oh, Penny, I know her. Good looking lady. Good looking lady. And starts going on about how he knows my mom and how pretty and nice she is, which is complete nonsense. My mom is a high-class accountant who works for a massive scholarly organization, and this guy is certainly not the type of person she comes in contact with. I give up on calling my mom. He gives me the paper he had been writing on. It had, assuming it was real, his full name, email address, and two phone numbers. He kept saying to call him if I wanted a job. I was like, okay, yeah, sure. Then he pulls out another paper and pen and hands it to me. He asks for my full name, email, and phone number. I gave him a fake number and handed it back to him. He said, No, your full name too. I told him, Oh no, I'm sorry sir, my mama wouldn't be happy if I gave that out. He starts trying to convince me that it would be okay. At this point I panic and shove the paper with a fake number at him and say, I'm sorry, I have to go. And just literally run away, down the stairs to the street. My mom finally calls me back. Her phone had been on silent. I was terrified and kept looking behind me to see if he was following me, because he started to when I started to run. Mom leaves the condo and runs towards the station, and we met in the middle. I have never been so relieved to see my mom. She brought me home and kept an eye out over our shoulders for the guy. I still have the paper with his supposed full name and contact info. I just feel like I needed to share this story because I'm still scared. I had to go back to both those stations today and... I was terrified he would be there. I was in fight or flight mode the whole walk to the station.
I felt terrible about this, but any time I saw a guy that looked like him, I nearly jumped out of my skin. Thank God that wore off over time when I got to my class, but I'm still scared I'm going to encounter him again. I'm still on campus, I'm going to have to go back to those stations again today, and I'm so anxious that he'll be there. I just felt like I needed to talk about it so I wouldn't be scared anymore. I was around 9 or 10 years old. I was with my best friend and our parents. We were on our way to the nearest shopping town. We lived in the rural-ish area with not many shops and would probably be finished looking around in 10 minutes. So we traveled by train to our nearest large town and city. It was easier, probably cheaper and definitely quicker. So when the train arrived, me and my friend quickly ran to secure the first table seats. Those ones with four seats and a table in the middle. The train was pretty empty and with us being kids, we wanted our own table seats and decided to take up the ones on the opposite side of the aisle and left our parents across from us. I noticed a guy a couple of rows down in the normal seats, on his phone in a really strange position. It looked like he was taking photos of me. This was back in the day where selfies didn't really exist, so it was more than likely that he was either taking a photo or was using his phone ridiculously weird. So I pulled the collar of my coat over my face and looked the other way as I shrunk into my seat. I didn't mention anything because, to be honest, I thought I was being outrageous. A couple of minutes later, a lady who I remember being tall, slim, and blonde with a wavy bob and glasses went over to my mom. She crouched down next to her and spoke very quietly and softly. I couldn't really hear her well enough to know what she was saying, but my mom's face told the whole story. Mum asked me to come sit with her, and my friend's mum and the lady went to the conductor of the train. When we got to the next station, there were a group of police officers and security waiting on the platform. The train pulled up, and the weird guy was taken away. We heard that he did in fact take photos of me, and they found hundreds of photos of other children on his phone and computer. They didn't go into details, but I didn't ride a train for a very, very long time after that. This happened about a year ago when I was visiting my family back home in the city from a college during winter break. My old high school friends decided to all get together at the bowling alley to catch up, but because I was the only one without a car, my best friend offered to pick me up from the nearest rail train station. That station also happens to double as a bus transfer station, so a variety of people, homeless, drunk, sober, etc. passed through. I had just gotten off the train and it wasn't too dark out yet and I called my friend and told him to pick me up by the pickup and drop-off area, which was just between the transportation hub and the parking structure, and he told me it was going to be a 20-minute wait, so I stood waiting on the sidewalk. For some reason, there wasn't a lot of traffic coming into the pickup and drop-off area, but there were two cars in the area, most likely waiting to pick up a relative or friend, just sitting in their cars on their phones. After a few minutes pass, I see two European men, late 20s maybe, stumbling around drunk towards the area. I didn't really think anything of it because I reasoned that they were most likely headed towards their car in the parking structure, but they kept getting closer to me. One of the guys started to catcall me in slurred words saying, baby and beautiful, and the other soberer one was sneering at me. Eventually I realized that they were not just catcalling me from afar, but walking to me, and after they got within three feet of me, I sped walk a few paces to the side. At this point, the more drunk guy starts cussing at me and laughing and I just brush off the encounter when they stumble away. About 10 minutes pass and it starts to get dark and one of the two cars that was waiting had driven away, so now there's only one car with an Asian guy waiting in the pickup drop off area with me, nobody else around. Then I hear a car screech and rapidly pull up to the drop off area and the other car and I get startled and we see this banged up car roll the windows down. That's when I see that it was the same two guys from before and realized they were purposely harassing me because the parking lot does not require them to go through the pickup or drop off area. The car then pulls right up to where I was standing and I see the car door open. The one that was more drunk jumps out at me with both of his hands to grab, but I kind of dodge and he just narrowly misses touching me. At this point, 
I ran the 40 or so feet to where the Asian guy's car was and I'm sort of screaming because I am genuinely afraid I am going to be kidnapped. I guess the Asian guy had watched the whole thing because he looked just as freaked out as I was. I stood by his car and as the drunk guy stumbled on the sidewalk and looked at us, the Asian guy turned on the headlights and then turned on his high beams. The drunk guy stares at us for a minute, disoriented by the lights, mumbling in some European language, probably more cuss words, it sounded almost Turkish or Russian, and then eventually gets back in the car and drives away. I stayed by this guy's car until my friend pulls up and I get into my friend's car and start crying. I tell my mom later I think I almost got kidnapped, but she tells me that they were probably just drunk jerks trying to scare a little girl. But I don't think so. I think they were up to something more sinister. I'm a cosplayer. I'm not famous, but I'm well known enough in my city to be recognized once in a while. I wrote a while back about three men on a train who tried to attack me. I rarely take the train unaccompanied now, but sometimes I have to. I prefer to be able to drive everywhere, but parking in my city is one of the most expensive in Canada, and I'm a freelance photographer by profession and can't always afford to pay $30 for a couple hours downtown, so I take the train. My boyfriend had to stay at a friend's the night before and would be meeting me on the other side of the town to take me to the photo shoot. I was dressed as Misa but I was wearing a coat over my outfit and regular shoes. So besides my big false lashes and the hem of my pleather shirt, there was nothing to indicate I was cosplaying. It was 5.30am and we were driving to the next town over for the shoot so we had to get started early. It was a Saturday morning so most of the people in the train were those heading home from an overnight shift. I actually really like the early hours because usually no one gives me a hard time or even speaks to me, but every once in a while. I had arrived from the second last stop in the northwest all the way to a station in the southwest, so the train crosses half the city. A man got on downtown, six stops until I got off. My light had texted me to say he was there already. Though there were many empty seats, the man sat directly across from me. Hey, he said. I hadn't had any coffee and wasn't up for conversation so I didn't respond. I pretended not to hear him and kept scrolling through Facebook. Hey, he said louder. I glanced up at him. You're really pretty, he said. I didn't respond verbally. I just nodded slightly to acknowledge I'd heard him. To be honest, I am pretty. I'm not skinny or even super fit, though I'm also not overly heavy anymore, but I do have some attractive features. I'm used to people telling me I'm pretty, especially when I've done my makeup for a photo shoot. Did you hear me? I said you're pretty. You look really hot. His voice was irritated. I heard you. Yeah, I am pretty. I responded. I was feeling irritable before he started talking to me. Lack of coffee and all, and I didn't really feel like him stating something that was true needed to be thanked. You're not that pretty. He practically snarled this vain chicks like you should be taught a lesson. I've gotten this reaction before from men, usually online or from cat callers. There's an idea that some people have that you're only what they say you are. They don't want women to know they're beautiful unless a man says they are. I rolled my eyes and went back to looking at my phone. Four stops left. I knew that after the next stop there would be a long portion through a tunnel. The lights were on in the train so I wasn't worried about him doing anything scary. I should cut that pretty face, he said. A few other passengers had looked up at this point. The guy was speaking loudly, and I was a little nervous now. Three stops left. A few people got onto the train, the last stop downtown. The guy leaned towards me across the train. I'm going to mess you up if you get off this train, he said. After my last horrifying experience on the train, this made me really nervous. The guy cosplaying as Light didn't have a car so we'd be walking to the mall 10 minutes away to wait for my boyfriend. Light's not a big guy, he's an inch shorter than me actually. Fight me, I said quietly. I don't know why but I have a tendency to act stupid and tough when I'm afraid. This guy was bigger than me and could probably kill me with little difficulty but it was now 5.45am and I was grouchy and hadn't had coffee. I'm going to break your little neck. He said loudly. We were passing through the tunnel. 
The train is always very loud in the tunnels and I don't think any other passengers could hear him. We get out of the tunnel and approach the next stop. This is the last one before I have to get off. At this stop, most of the people get off. Besides me and the guy threatening me, there are only two other people in the train. A big guy with headphones and a little older lady. Back off, man. My boyfriend is waiting for me at the station. I lie. I wish I would chosen to sit near a door. I'm scared that if I try to get up to get to the emergency call button, he'll attack me. No one want a fat chick like you. But don't worry. I like them fat. He said this loudly. I'm 150 pounds and 5 foot 6. I'm slightly overweight, but I work out and have healthy eating habits, so my doctor isn't worried. Thistle! I heard someone say loudly. It was the big guy with the headphones. Thistle's the name I use when I'm cosplaying. I thought that was you. What are you doing up so early? He walked over to where I was sitting and sat down next to me. I don't recognize him, but I realize he heard what the guy had said to me and is coming to defend me. Just meeting some friends. I try to keep my voice cheerful. I'm careful to avoid looking at the guy across from us. Nice. I'm just getting off of work. Where are you getting off? He asks me. Next stop, I reply. No kidding, me too. The guy across from us had leaned back in the seat, though he's still glaring at us. When we get to the next stop, the big guy gets off the train with me. We meet up with my friend and he walks us to the mall. The creepy guy followed us for a few blocks and then disappeared. I was still afraid so the guy waited with us until my boyfriend arrived. We wound up giving him a lift home because his stop was actually about five further down the line. I don't know if the creep on the train would have actually hurt me, but I'm glad I didn't have to find out. This occurred back in 2012 when I was 18. I was interrailing through Europe with my then boyfriend and we were on a train between Rome and a port town in Italy where we would be getting a boat to Greece the following day. We hadn't pre-booked any accommodation as we'd found it really easy to get a hostel either en route or on arrival at our previous destinations and as we'd be arriving in the town at nearly midnight we decided to have a look for hostels whilst on the train. Unfortunately, we found that there really wasn't as much accommodation where we were heading as there had been in the other major cities we had visited, and that the places we could find were mainly hotels and way out of our price range. We were discussing this quandary amongst ourselves, my ex suggesting we slept at the station, when the guy sitting next to me on the train randomly struck up a conversation. He was really enthusiastic and chatty and spoke pretty good English, asking about our trip so far where we were from and just sort of general chit chat about ourselves. He also said that he overheard our accommodation problem and that he knew a perfect hostel for us, very close to the station and run by his friend. Initially, this just came across as useful bit of information but alarm bells started ringing for me as he had become very insistent that we must stay there and that if we mentioned his name and that he had sent us that we could stay there for virtually free. He wrote down an address and his name on a piece of paper and virtually had me promise that we would go there. After I'd given my word that we'd stay there, he stopped talking to me entirely, which I found quite odd. He'd been so warm and talkative and then just totally shut off. He also made three phone calls, none of which I could understand other than he said the word interrail a few times. The rest of the journey passed in slightly uncomfortable silence and when I got up to get off the train, he just said, Remember referring to the address. We arrived in the town. It was late and pretty deserted. Nothing like the big touristy cities we had been used to and I made up my mind then and there we definitely wouldn't be staying in that hostel. My boyfriend was slightly annoyed as I admittedly am a very paranoid person but something felt really off to me. We ended up checking into an annoyingly expensive hotel literally a stone's throw from the station as I was so creeped out I didn't want to go wandering off through the empty streets at night. Whilst at the hotel, I decided to look up the address he gave us. First thing to say is that if you googled it, there was no mention at all of it being a hostel or a guest house or anything. It just came up as a street address. And secondly, if you put it in Google Maps, it wasn't anywhere near the station and just looked like a normal building in a residential area, 
way out of the city center. I know that all of this may have a perfectly innocent explanation behind it, and it may have just been that the guy ran a hostel from his house, and train guy was just overly eager to promote his business for his mate, but the whole encounter felt very off to me, and I was relieved to leave the town the following day. I can't help but wonder, to this day, whether or not we were being sent into some sort of trap. For a little context, I'm now 22 and this happened when I lived back in my hometown around the ages of 11 to 13. For this story you should know that where my house was, was like any other normal UK street, except for the fact that there was an alleyway down to a train bridge that led to a dirt track that led down to what we called the commons, i.e. woodland area with a small cafe and a golf course. The commons were somewhere myself and my family would go all the time as I grew up, as something to do to cure boredom, to walk the dog, etc. I even used to go down there with my friends as we got older. On this particular occasion, I was taking a walk down to the commons with a family member as something to do to cure boredom. The commons are beautiful in the summer, and it is a lovely time to walk down there. It never felt creepy or sinister until this particular day. As myself and my family member have walked the train bridge and are walking down the dirt path towards the woods, we stop at a turnstile that leads to the train tracks which you just cross in order to get to the woods. As we reached here, we were greeted with the sight of a middle-aged, out-of-shape man laying on the train tracks. Red flags immediately start firing. The man jumps up and makes his way to talk to us. In conversation with him, he seemed normal. He was polite, positive, I'd even dare to say happy-go-lucky. He immediately spoke with my family members something like the following. Afternoon. What brings you two out on this lovely afternoon? Uh, we're just enjoying a walk through the woods to kill some time. Sounds lovely. What a nice idea. Have a nice afternoon. And then he went straight back to laying down, on the tracks. As we passed by him to the woodland, my family member paused and went back to have an exchange with him. I couldn't hear what was said, but weird guy changed in a flash. Aggressive violent. Whatever he said to my family member, it shook him as he came back pale. He wouldn't tell me what was said, but just said we should push on and for me to not look back. Anyway, we continue walking, and despite being shaken up by the incident, it slips to the back of my mind. The woodlands we walk in has a route that circles all the way back round to the dirt path, and that's the one we always took. As we were walking back up, we passed the turnstile, and the weirdo was nowhere to be seen. However, as we walked the dirt path covered in thick foliage, we suddenly heard blood-curdling screams. They were loud, terrifying and downright bone-chilling. Someone was getting hurt. That person sounded to be female. My family member rushed us back up the path and back to the house ASAP. Fast forward a few years later and my family member explains that in the confrontation with the weirdo, he inquired as to what he was doing and if he needed help, and that it was unsafe to help, and his response was basically, leave me alone, or I'll seriously hurt or kill you. That was enough for my family member to leave him alone. Also, we later found out that the screams that we had heard were linked to a murder in the woods. My family member couldn't remember if it was linked to the guy we met, but it seemed likely. This happened when I was quite young. I was at a train station in London with my family walking through a crowd of people to catch our train, when all of a sudden this old man from behind me grabs my shoulder and starts screaming in my face that I kicked him. I immediately start crying so my mom and her husband turn around and start asking this man what the problem is. He just continues shouting and swearing saying that I kicked him. Bear in mind that I honestly didn't kick anyone and he was behind me. My mom's husband starts getting in his face and he runs off somewhere, so we go to find a member of staff to report what happened. We finally find someone and once we've explained our situation, they get some other staff to go and find this man, which they eventually do and remove him from the station because of his behavior. We also got moved up to first class, which was really nice of them.
This happened to me in Europe when I was still a student, about 11 years ago, and this time in France. I went to see my friend Jay in the suburbs and wanted to take the last train home to the city where I lived. It was past 11 p.m., but I do not remember the exact time. He dropped me off in front of the station in his green estate car and left. Nothing unusual. On the platform, I was told by a couple of teenagers that the trains had been cancelled due to a suicide on the line. This was confirmed by the announcement screen on the platform. The station was unmanned at that time of the night. Being a student, a taxi was out of the question, so I called Jay to ask him to come and drive me home. He said he would only be a few minutes as he was only around the corner. A few minutes pass and a green estate car arrives and parks in front of the station. I don't hesitate, open the passenger door and climb in, and I am puzzled. Why does Jay have little plastic bags filled with leaves on the dashboard? They weren't there earlier. Why does he have a machete stuck between the passenger seat and his seat? I look up at him to ask these questions and, why is this guy not my friend and why is he staring at me like that? I snap out of it. I, I think I have the wrong car. I think you do. My friend is just around the corner. He's coming to pick me up. You have the same car. He locks the door. Thankfully, Jay arrives at that point, passes us and parks and gets out of his car. Jay is big, does boxing, and the guy next to me sees it. The door clicks open. I bolt out of the car, run to Jay, shouts at him to get in his car and drive. He doesn't ask questions and we drive off. Once I calm down, he told me he got out of his car because he could see a bunch of youngsters approaching the exit of the station and they had baseball bats. He was wondering if I was in any kind of trouble. Jay thinks the guy had locked me in the car to protect me from the young guys. I'm not that sure myself. I'm glad he came back when he did, so I never had to find out. I've only told this to a few people outside of my family, and I only recently started talking about it. I wish I'd told someone sooner as I discovered a co-worker encountered these men as well. I work downtown, standard 8-5 to five hours. Once in a while I work overtime, but not often, and not on the day this happened. It was just a couple of minutes after 5pm when I left work. It's just a few blocks from my office building to the train station. There are a few bars and back alleys along the walk, but... The worst I've ever dealt with along there are homeless folks who get a little aggressive asking for cash. They don't bother me much. The train ride from the station downtown to the station where I park my car is about 40 minutes. If I'm lucky, I manage to get a seat and don't have to stand for the whole ride. On that day, I was lucky, more or less. I got a seat next to a window which left the seat next to me open. At the next stop, three men got on. One of them sat next to me and the other sat on the seats across from me so they were facing me. I was listening to my music on my iPod so I couldn't really hear them. I did notice, however, that the guy sitting next to me was trying to move closer to me on the seat. He would move close enough that his leg was touching mine, so I'd scoot away and he'd move closer again. Eventually, I was pressed right against the window and had no doubt that he had more than a few inches of free space on his other side. I was wearing sunglasses and could surreptitiously glance at them. I noticed that they would occasionally say something then all look at me. It was incredibly creepy and uncomfortable. I was nervous about getting off at my stop but minus the second to last one on the train line. So when the train pulled into my station, I got off. The guy sitting next to me tried to grab my arm but I was moving quickly and was able to get out. I was hoping they wouldn't get off the train there. It was a busy station and they couldn't know where I was parked, and they did. I guess it was their luck that they'd targeted me. I parked in the farthest lot from the station because the parking there is free. It's about a seven minute walk, which isn't usually too bad, but my lot tends to be pretty quiet and I was really worried about these guys following me. As a bit of background, I was fat. I work in an office job and I was sitting all day and not working out. Add to that my strong sweet tooth and you've got a recipe for a bad body. I was about 30 pounds overweight and probably couldn't run more than 30 seconds. Sad, considering I ran track and played hockey in high school. I still play hockey, but on a women's day team league and it's really not competitive. I'm the youngest on my team by about 20 years, but my mom is on the team and it's something fun to do together. 
I was crossing the bridge over the road from the station to the parking lot when I noticed the three guys less than ten feet behind me. I wasn't carrying a knife, though I do own a legal sized knife, nor any pepper spray, because it's illegal in my Canadian city. I know a little bit about personal protection though, a required class for girls at the private high school I attended in my youth, so I put my car key and my house key between my fingers, so if I needed to hit someone, it would hurt them, at least a little. The guys followed me across the main lot. They didn't hide the fact that they were there, and the more nervous I was, the louder they laughed. I managed to get across the road between the lots before they got to the road. They had to wait for a couple of cars to pass before they could cross. I was almost halfway across the lot when they crossed the road. I started to run. I could hear their feet pounding pavement behind me. I used my clicker to unlock my car when I got close. I wrenched the door open, so glad that there was no one parked next to me. I had barely closed my door and slammed the lock when the guys reached my car. They were banging on my window and yelling, jeering. I had never been so afraid in my life. I was worried they'd break the windows to get in. There was a guy behind me banging on the back of my hatchback so I couldn't reverse out of my spot without running him over. I should have, but I was afraid and not thinking. I was screaming, but no one was around to hear me. I didn't know what they wanted, but I knew it wasn't anything good. I wish I had the screamer my mom had given me for protection, but it needed a new battery so I didn't bring it with me. That thought, the one about the screamer, made me realize I had something even better. When you're being assaulted, you're not supposed to scream for help. No one wants to help. And you scream fire, because everyone wants to watch the blaze. So I turned on my car alarm. It was incredibly loud in my car, so loud I thought I would go deaf, but it had the reaction I wanted. The guy started backing off. I saw people walking into the lot looking in the direction of my car. People could see what was going on. The guys took off back towards the train station, and I drove home crying. The next night, I started working out. I have worked out almost every day since then. If those cars hadn't been in the road at that time, if I'd just run a little slower, if I'd been too slow clicking the lock, it all could have ended so much differently. I've lost 20 pounds since then and have gained a great deal of muscle. I quit my job. I've had anxiety issues for years and this encounter made it so much worse. I never want to feel that powerless again. In order to really paint the picture of you of the scariest event I have ever experienced in my entire life, and to really feel that moment when my blood turned to ice in my veins, I've got to give you a little background on my rather unconventional and messed up childhood. I'll try to keep this part brief. I'm sure this will sound like utter crap to some, but I assure you it's not. I'm telling the absolute truth, even if it does sound like a badly produced after-school special. My father kidnapped me from my mother when I was a baby, not because he loved me and couldn't live without me, but because he's a sociopathic douchebag that wanted to hurt my mother as much as he could. I was missing for roughly six years, based on the back of a milk carton, the whole nine. My father was an ex-military survivalist that smuggled drugs over the Mexican-American border among other things at that time. During these most formative years of my development, I was surrounded by criminals and raised by this neglectful idiot. I had a lot of severe trauma very young. Let's just say that I knew what real monsters were. By the time I was located and returned to my mother just after I turned seven, I knew how to load, clean, and assemble several different types of guns. I knew to aim for the head of the men wearing blue uniforms, and I was a good shot with a handgun. I had been left alone for days at a time repeatedly and often, so I was completely self-sufficient and could care for myself. I didn't go to school and only had been around other kids for very rare, brief moments in time. I was a feral little beast at this point. I didn't trust adults or anyone for that matter. In my experience, most people were liars and didn't show you their true face. Lucky for me, I was returned to a loving home with my mother and stepfather. With love, therapy, and protection by the two of them, I think I turned out to be a relatively normal and surprisingly mentally healthy woman, albeit with a few idiosyncrasies. Now, the point of all this preamble is to give you some context regarding the kind of person I am. 
I'm not a victim. I don't take crap from people, and there are very few things in this world that truly terrify me. I am a survivor. Growing up that way, I did. I studied people intensely as a defense mechanism. I am very good at reading people and their emotions, at times even the feelings they won't admit to themselves. I have been left with an obsession for my security and of those I love, so I tend to be hypervigilant of my surroundings. There is always a weapon of some type on my person or in my belongings wherever I go, and I take note of every exit and entrance of any place I step into. As a teenager, my stepfather taught me some tricks on how to take down someone that was bigger and or stronger than me. He was a biker and at one time a bartender and bouncer at a rowdy biker bar, so he knew his stuff. You would think I would be prepared, right? The story that I am trying to get to here was one of the few times in my adult life that someone slipped through all my defenses and nearly got to my young daughters. Now it's one thing to fear for your own safety, but to fear for the safety of your children, as I'm sure every parent knows, is something entirely different. It is ice cold, blood curdling, absolute sheer terror, and I never, ever, ever want to experience it again. I was living in San Francisco roughly seven years ago. At the time, I managed a medical office inside a large residential drug rehab center. The residents were a mix of characters ranging from the homeless and mentally ill to straight out of San Quentin parolees. I actually enjoyed my work and never felt unsafe there, but it was exhausting. It was Friday at the end of a 50-hour work week, and I couldn't wait to get home and put my feet up. The building I worked in was donated by the Catholic Church and used to be an old convent. It's a four-story stone behemoth, and I ran up and down three of those floors all day every day that week. It's been a rough week, and I was deep to the bones tired, as well as mentally fried. It was no quick commute home for me, however. My job was in the Fillmore Lower Height area, and my babysitter lived near Balboa Park, where I lived in the Sunset District next to San Francisco State. The fastest way home involved walking two city blocks to get to a bus which would drop me near the closest underground station. From there, hop on a train that would take me all the way across the city, nearby to the end of the line. At least the babysitter didn't live far from the line so I didn't need to transfer to another bus. Once I had my girls, I would have to wait for the next train to head back down to the M line and finally a 15 to 20 minute trek on foot to the back of the small city sized complex where our apartment was. I had made it to the babysitter's house uneventfully and stood waiting for the next train, counting the minutes down until we would be at our front door. This was an above ground stop so my habit was to hold the hand of my 7 year old and half my 3 year old toddler on my hip clamber up the steps and carry her through the train to find a seat. Although she was able to walk, she wasn't so balanced on a moving subway train, as well as being a toddler, so she tended to fall over and become easily distracted by the other people on the train. Strollers seemed to me more of a pain than they were helpful when dealing with public transit, so this had become my routine. Looking back, I'm sure I looked an easy target. It's not like I present this as a hardened and grizzled person, there's really nothing intimidating about me, I don't think. I knew I had balls of steel, but unless you challenged me, no one else would. I was a 27-year-old, exhausted single mother just trying to get home with my kids and belongings in tow. We were on the final leg of the journey home, and being so tired and wiped out, my defenses were down. So when I managed to get up the stairs onto the train and realized that the car was empty except for one homeless man... I just didn't feel it was worth to continue through the train cars to a more populated area. I observed this guy and quickly took mental note of him as was my habit. He was at the end of the train in the last car, right next to and opposite the door I entered from. He didn't look to be something I should be afraid of. Remember, I work with this population every day and I knew that most of these people were nothing to be afraid of. In my experience, most of these guys just had terrible lives followed by a series of bad decisions and or an inability to learn from their own mistakes. In fact, when I was traveling on my own, it was a habit of mine to sit down in the empty seat next to a homeless person, if they didn't appear to be intoxicated or schizophrenic, that no one else would take and strike up a conversation. If you ever want to see true joy in the eyes of another human, sit down next to a homeless person and talk to them like a regular person. You will make their day. 
but I digress. He appeared to be in his mid-forties, unkempt shaggy hair and scruffy facial hair, wearing several layers of raggy stained clothes with an oversized coat that hung past his knees. He had a tall can of beer in his hand, I noticed, but didn't seem overly attentive to my presence. Even though this man didn't set off a fear response for me, I was not in the mood to deal with an intoxicated hobo with my girls tonight, so I headed up the train hoping I'd make it onto the next car before we started moving. No such luck. Being the only group that got on the train at this stop, the train pulled off quickly and I had only made it near the end of this car. Balancing a tot on one hip, holding the hand of the other and all the weight of bags and purses on the other shoulder, I just kind of dropped and wilted into the empty seats we were next to at the front of the car. We didn't have far to go now, and I could see from my vantage point two people in the car ahead of me. I was in the habit of placing my girls on one seat to situate bags, and I always sat in the aisle seat as a protective measure. While we were getting settled and the train gets going, I hear this guy in the back start singing to himself. Honestly, I don't remember what, I just remember he seemed happy. I had filed this man away in my brain as just another homeless guy riding the train at night on a loop to stay warm, which they did often. Most of the time they don't bother anyone because they don't want to get kicked off the train. I figured he had panhandled enough that night for a beer and a ticket, and I didn't begrudge him a little joy and warmth as long as he stayed away from my kids. As I'm sitting there attending to my girls kind of half aware of the hobo in the back, I slowly register that his singing is getting a little louder, more boisterous and closer. I glance over my shoulder to see he is hobbling our direction and looking at my toddler who is peeking at him over the back of the seat as she's sitting on her knees. I start to pay a little more attention to his whereabouts, but again there's nothing that says to me he's dangerous. I have no problem enforcing boundaries with strangers in public, but I also have a lot of compassion for these guys. After all, with a couple of different turns in my own past, that could have been me. It's apparent this guy has had more than one tall boy that night as he is sort of swaying and slurring his words, but he appears to be singing for my little tot because she is tickled pink, giggling, and smiling the more animated his singing becomes. I study his face, but his smile doesn't seem creepy to me at all. He honestly doesn't seem like a possible chester to me or have any ill intent, he just seemed to enjoy entertaining an adorable little girl. Maybe he had kids of his own somewhere that he missed, or maybe he was just lonely. Even so, I didn't want to engage with this guy and encourage him, so I was paying a little more attention to what he was doing now out of my peripheral view. By this time, he had made it pretty close to us, and he dropped into the bench seat that was a couple of rows and on the opposite side of us, roughly seven feet away. We were sitting in the forward-facing seats at the front of the car, now I was wary but still not afraid or skeeved out by this guy. He starts chatting with me at this point. In his slurred speech he says, Beautiful family you got there. You're a lucky mom to have such cute kids. I'm so not in the mood to talk to anyone right now but as I said, I have too much compassion for people down on their luck so I just politely say thank you without turning around. Still slurring, he launches into a tale about the family he used to have and everything that went wrong in his life. It doesn't seem to matter to him that I'm not really engaging, but he's not coming any closer to us, so I don't stop him or interrupt. Now, what happens next is my first inkling that this guy may not be what he seems. It's not so much what he says that does it, but the sudden shift in tone and personality. He's not slurring anymore. The volume of his voice has dropped a bit, and the tone of his voice changes to this Hannibal Lecter smugness. He's not talking to me anymore, but at my tot who is speaking at him again over my shoulder. Hello, little girl. Now, this guy had my full attention. Every cell in my body is saying pay attention to this hello Clarice fellow. I look over my shoulder to look directly at him and really assess his demeanor. His joviality seemed to be gone, and I don't see a happy hobo anymore, but a leering grin on his face that doesn't reach his dead-looking brown eyes. He is looking at my littlest tot, but then shifts his eyes to look at my seven-year-old who is also staring at him, although looking less entertained than her sister. This is the moment my blood runs cold. In that same Hannibal tone of voice, still not slurring, he says, Oh, aren't you the pretty little one? Such pretty white skin. So 
sexy. I'm looking directly at him when he says this, and what I see in his face has me terrified. I do not like the way he is looking at my daughter like she is a piece of meat. He realizes I am looking at him and shifts his eyes to look at me now and grins a little wider to show me a perfectly white intact smile that seems incongruous with the rest of his getup. I also notice that while his attire is dirty he himself seems pretty clean and his scruffy facial hair has a distinct line as if though he shaved it that way with purpose. Now maybe I'm just paranoid due to my past. Maybe this guy had gotten free dental work, maybe he had showered at his shelter but had nothing clean to put back on, and maybe he had gotten a free shave from a barber giving back. There are plenty of plausible explanations for what I observed, but but it's when I lock eyes with this guy that alarm bells go off in my head. What kind of man calls a seven-year-old sexy, and why did his demeanor seem to change so suddenly? Why did he seem perfectly sober? I have absolutely no doubt this man is a predator. My intuition, which I trust completely, says to get away from this guy now. All of this goes through my head in a nanosecond. I stand up to pick up my bags, adrenaline surging, heft the little one back to my hip, grab the hand of the oldest and head for the door of the car. Because I want the two people in the car ahead of me to hear, I wait for the doors to open before I turn back to him and loudly with my mama bear authority say, you stay away from us. I didn't care if I was wrong in my assumption, and I didn't care anymore if I hurt his feelings. I lumber to the front of the car and again sit in the very front forward seats. I don't go any further because this happens to be a long train with probably six or seven cars, and I don't see anybody on the next couple of cars from my vantage point. I want to stay with the other passengers. It's not unusual for the train to be this empty this far away from downtown, and at this time of night in between the commute rush and the Friday night club crowd. I'm used to disembarking alone or with very few others at my stop when I work this late. I'm starting to panic at this point about what I would do at my stop coming up. It is also in this part of the line that is still above ground, and I'm not going to have a crowd of people to get lost in. This creep could easily follow me on my walk through the complex and either attack me alone or follow me home. Because I'm pondering my predicament and literally terrified, I don't immediately register that the people who were on the car with me have gotten off the train and I am now alone again. Several minutes go by and we are getting close to our stop when I hear the whoosh of the car doors open behind me. Please be another passenger I'm praying to myself before I look behind me. Nope, it's creepy Hannibal Hobo headed toward me again but this time he is glaring at me. No more smile, no more singing, no more slurring, just an evil glare as he plods my direction. He's got his left hand up on the overhead bar with his right hand seeming to hold something inside his jacket as he plods toward me. My stomach drops into my toes and my heart leaps into my throat. We are all alone several cars behind anyone I can see. I don't wait to find out what he's got in his jacket. I hadn't set down any bags this time. They were still over my shoulder and I was still holding my youngest. So I grab the hand of my oldest and tell her we need to get to the front. I can tell she is scared now too, but I'm trying not to frighten her too bad. I kind of push and pull her gently in front of me, thinking if I can get to the front of the car, even if it's empty, I'll be right behind the conductor. I'm going as fast as I can, which isn't very fast with everything I'm juggling. As I'm nearing the doors again, I can see that the next car is empty, but the next car has people. I'm almost there as long as he doesn't catch up to us. We should be safe. We are now almost to my stop and the train is slowing down again. I hear the doors swoosh open again behind me. I glance over my shoulder to see the sky is running at me. Jesus Christ, I've never been so terrified in my entire life. I move ahead as fast as I can into the next car, but I know I'm not going to make it to the next filled with people, and no one seems to be looking this way from the car ahead, and the train is pulling into the stop. This is that moment when time just seems to slow down. I'm thinking this guy plans to incapacitate me with no hands to defend myself, and he is going to run off the stopping train with one or both of my girls. Now my adrenaline is surging, and I can feel my heart thumping at warp speed. I drop the bags from my shoulder, not caring about what's in them now. I need free movement. I tell my seven-year-old to stay behind me as I squat down to plop my youngest on the train floor. 
In one motion, I turn around, raise up, pull my pocket knife out of my back pocket, flip it open, taking a wide-legged defensive stance. I don't know if it was the security of my knife in my hand or that one final surge of adrenaline, but I swear to God as I stood up, I grew. I felt like Mario having just gotten his mushroom. I felt invincible, three times my size and superhuman. No one was going to get through to me to my babies, even if I was going to get stabbed. He stops dead in his tracks when he sees the knife about five feet in front of me. I sway a bit with the brake on the train, bringing it to a halt but keep my footing. Without thinking, I scream at this guy. Take one more step, and I'll cut off your balls and choke you with them. I see his eyes widen at this. He obviously did not expect this kind of reaction. He looks in my eyes, looks at the knife, looks behind me at my kids, and one more time glances back to my eyes. Then he turns tail and runs out the open doors and off the train. I barely register a couple of college students by the look of them. They hop onto my car and immediately hop off, probably because I'm still standing there looking like a psycho with a knife out. I hear the ding and swoosh of the doors closing again, and the train moves on. At this point, I just kind of crumple to the floor and hug my kids to me and burst into tears. My oldest is crying too while her little sister is just completely bewildered. I didn't move from the floor until we pulled into the next stop at West Portal, where we disembarked and I called my roommate and best friend. He was a man with big biceps and uncanny strength for his size. I wanted him to meet me at the train stop so we didn't have to walk through the complex alone in the dark after this craziness, which of course he did because he is amazing like that. I never stayed on an empty train after that. No matter how tired I am, I will move to a car full of people. I never saw Hannibal Hobo again, and I don't care. I don't think he ever wants to meet me again, either. This is without a doubt the most terrifying thing that has ever happened to me. I have only told a few people but feel like I need to share it in case it helps any students traveling abroad to be more cautious. So a little background. This happened to me about five years ago when I was 19 and studying abroad in Italy. Our school had its own campus about an hour outside of Rome in a quiet town where the Pope has a summer place. Part of our school's program in Italy was that we had to leave campus for 10 days to vacation and explore Europe in October. Everybody would split off into their friend groups and travel. I didn't really have a group I was attached to, but not wanting to go by myself, I asked these two girls I was friendly with if I could travel with them. They were best friends and roommates and were nice enough and said I could go with them. We decided to travel from Rome to Austria, Prague and Germany via the Eurorail train. We went the entire trip having fun and without incident until the last day which is where my awful experience begins. On our last day, we were in Munich, meeting up with most of our class as a school tradition of sorts. The two girls I was traveling with, and I had tickets to take the overnight train that night back to Rome from Munich, left around midnight. During the day, one of the girls tells me that she had changed her plan ten days before we left and was going to stay in Munich overnight and come back the next day, which was a surprise to me. But I still wasn't that worried because she was joining up with our classmates and staying in a booked hostel with them, and I would still be traveling with this other girl. Then to my dismay, the other girl says she is changing her mind and staying overnight in Munich as well. I asked her where she planned to stay as we hadn't booked a room in a hostel. She said she would sneak into the hostel and share a bed with the other girl. I told her that I was really uncomfortable traveling alone, and that it wasn't fair for her to abandon me like that. She told me nonchalantly, that I could just find a hostel and book another ticket if I cared too much. I told her I didn't have the extra money to pay for a separate ticket back to Rome, let alone a hostel in addition to that. Now, I was a college student on a very tight budget, and I already spent a lot on this trip and didn't have enough in my bank account. Despite my pleas, those petty girls said essentially that it was not their problem and ditched me. Luckily, we had already met up with another group of our classmates who felt bad for me, and spent the entire last day of our vacation running all around Munich trying to find me a hostel to stay at that night and even offered to pool their money together to help me pay for a ticket back. 
Unfortunately, it was Oktoberfest in Germany, and literally every hostel was completely booked up, and despite my attempts to sneak into my friend's hostels with them, I was stopped and thrown out. At this point, it's nighttime. I was defeated and worried, but my other classmates who had tried to help me were still sticking with me. I figured at this point the only options I had were to sleep outside on a bench in Munich, totally unsafe and ridiculous, or take the overnight train back to Rome by myself. Not super safe, but I figured I'd be around other people, so maybe not completely awful. So I decided to go ahead and take the overnight train back to Rome by myself, and my classmates walked me to the station and saw me on the train. These guys actually ended up being some of my closest friends in years to come. So now I'm on this overnight train by myself, and I head to my carriage. The way it was set up was it was a room off a hallway with six seats. No beds because trying to save money. I was the first one in my carriage, so I sit next to the window on one side and put my giant backpacker's pack, which was my only luggage, on the two seats next to me. Eventually, two German guys in their 30s come in and are polite enough and sit opposite me. They converse with each other, they've got their suitcases, and are looking at maps of Rome and tourist things to do. I feel safe enough with these guys since they're minding their own business, and this is where it gets bad. I settle in and listen to music and try to sleep for a bit, and perhaps after an hour or so I start to notice there's a super sketchy guy standing right outside our carriage in the middle of the hallway staring at me. I'm completely freaked out because 1. No one is supposed to just be in the hallway standing there. You're either on your way to the loo or headed back to your carriage. Why would anyone just be standing in the hallway? And 2. He didn't break eye contact with me once when I looked at him. He just kept staring at me with a sinister look on his face like he wanted to eat me up. So I'm kind of freaking out and trying to look away and pretend like I didn't really notice him. I wait a bit to see if he was just a normal guy going to or from the loo or something, but when I look back, he's still there, hasn't moved, and is still leering at me from behind the window door of my carriage. I want to go shut the curtains to our carriage so he can't look in, but I don't want to get too close to him or anger him or anything, so I turn to the two German guys and quietly tell them that the guy there is creeping me out and staring at me and making me uncomfortable and I asked them if one of them could casually in a minute or so close the curtains. I had hoped that they'd be men and kind and protect me and tell the guy to bugger off or whatever, but they seemed annoyed at me and mumbled that they would, but never did. When I brought it up again, they kind of acted miffed, but eventually shut the curtain. I thought that surely that would have deterred the guy from lurking, and I soon fell asleep. A few hours later I awoke to three young Germans in their mid-late thirties join our carriage in the remaining three seats. As they come in, I notice that the creepy guy from before is still there, standing outside my door. I kind of freak out inside, and really don't feel comfortable at all, and I'm a bit panicky. I try to talk to the younger Germans, but they weren't very friendly, and perhaps didn't speak English very well. It's been hours at this point, and I notice that I really have to pee but the only way for me to get to the loo is to go outside of the carriage and down the hall to the loo and at the very end of the train a bit away from other carriages with people. I noticed that when the younger Germans came in, they moved the curtain a bit so I can see the creepy dude standing out there leering at me still. He refuses to go away. I noticed that when people walk by to use the loo or whatever, he kind of acts casual like he's waiting for someone or something and looks away from my carriage, but once they're gone, he's back at it again. I try to hold it in as long as I can, but this is a 12 hour train ride and would be another 4 hours or more before we made it to Rome and there was no way I was going to make it. At this point everyone in my carriage has been asleep for a long time and I don't want to wake anymore. I have to nudge the young Germans on my way out of the carriage to go to the loo and I try to tell them I'm going to the loo and could they just keep an eye on me and the creepy lurker and they brush me off like I'm a jerk for waking them up and they go back to sleep. I exit the carriage freaked out of my mind and also about to pee my pants and of course I basically run into the creepy dude standing outside my carriage. There's hardly any room in the hallway and he's not giving me any space and is staring me down. I am 5 foot 4 and he was towering over me like 6 foot 2 or something and burly so I do my best to book it to the loo as fast as I can and lock the door behind me. My heart is racing and I'm going as fast as I can so that hopefully he hasn't followed me here. But alas, 
I get out of the loo and he is right there with this disgusting smile on his face. I mean, I don't like to exaggerate, but there was an evil in his eyes and it chilled me. I was sick to my stomach. I tried to squeeze by him quickly and he started to press himself against me. I gave him my nasty face and yelled for him to let me go. And praise tiny baby Jesus there was a man headed to the loo my way just then. So the creepy guy dude moved off me and I booked it back to my carriage where I proceeded to stay for the remainder of the ride. I thought that my outburst and little scene I caused would have deterred that sketchy guy from creeping on me anymore. But when I looked up at some point, I noticed he was right back where he was in the hallway, staring at me. At this point, I was kind of in disbelief that someone could be this blatantly lecherous, so I started to wonder if there was actually a seat out in the hallway that was cheaper than a shared carriage, but then I realized that I had left to go to the bathroom earlier and I had seen no seats, and I also remembered one unsettling detail too. This guy had no luggage, not even a briefcase. This was a 12 plus hour trip from Germany to Rome, so everyone on this train was either coming or going from work or a pleasure trip, but all of them had at least a small travel suitcase of sorts. So the fact that this guy had no luggage or briefcase or anything on him and was just standing in the hallway staring at me made my stomach drop. This man did not have good intentions and I couldn't rationalize it any other way. I spent the last hour or so of the trip devising my plan for once the train arrived in Rome. I knew the train station there very well and knew that the metro train I needed to transfer to get back to my campus was down several flights of stairs and around more than a few twists and turns. I felt pretty confident so when the train stopped I had my backpack on ready to go. The other Germans got out of the train ahead of me and the creepy guy had to move for them to pass and I quickly followed in between them and jumped off the train and booked it through the station without looking behind me. Thank god it was crowded in the station with people headed to work and so I felt safe that I was disguised in the crowd. I flew down the flights of stairs and around the turns without stopping. When I finally got down to the platform for the local metro train I needed, I felt safe. I was just catching my breath when I saw none other than the creepy guy come down the stairs and look around for me. When he saw me, he had that evil, lecherous look in his eye and I wanted to cry. I grabbed tightly onto my pocket knife in my coat pocket and made my way to a group of harmless looking Italians and tried to stand in their group. They seemed annoyed that I was standing so close to them. I don't know, maybe it was my giant backpacker backpack or my scared and sweaty disheveledness, who knows. I was standing still about several train car lengths away from him at this point, but he was starting to make his way over to me just as the train pulled up. I hopped on my car immediately and tried to position myself near some folks who rudely kept scooting away from me. I noticed he got on a few cars away. As the car was moving, he made his way down his car into the next, and with each stop the train made, he got a little closer to me. I myself moved a car's length down away from him, but I grew increasingly worried that the farther outside of the metro Rome area, the fewer people were on the train and the closer he was getting to me. When I made it to the first car and realized I had nowhere else to go, I looked and noticed he was only one car away from me and headed my way. As we pulled into the next stop, I grabbed my pocket knife tightly and made a last ditch effort to evade him and get off the train. I looked to my right and to my horror saw that he had gotten off as well and was briskly running toward me. As the last few people shoved past me to get on the train, I realized I had no options left and threw myself back and dove into the train without breaking eye contact with this sicko as the doors to the train closed in front of him and I realized I had made it safely onto the train, leaving him on the platform fuming and yelling as the train sped off. Not really believing I had made it safely, I spent the rest of the metro ride still in fight or flight mode and dashed upstairs to my above ground bus up to my campus making sure I was sitting next to a sweet old lady. The creepy dude never showed up on the bus, and once I had made it back inside my campus's walls, I immediately fell to the ground and sobbed. I realized I was so incredibly lucky that I had evaded what was probably a certain kidnapping, or even worse, who knows. But I have never forgotten that man's face, and the look in his eye, and how it made me feel like I wanted to peel my skin off and crawl under a rock and die. 
I ended up telling my ordeal to the dean of our campus and pleaded for him to reprimand those girls who abandoned me and forced me into a compromising position which was completely unsafe. I wanted the dean to tell all the students and future students that it is never okay to let someone travel alone, especially females, and especially since most of us were young and felt invincible and were just plain naive and stupid and didn't know what was safe and what wasn't. But that weasel of a dean thought I was overreacting, and I was probably asking for it. Yeah, it was a school that victim blame and thought leggings were impure, and thought the girls who abandoned me were goody-goodies, and I was some loose rebel who got herself into this position. And he never addressed it. I haven't heard anyone else at my school getting into situations like me, but I've made sure to tell all the girls and guys who are in years below me to be careful when they study abroad, and to not do what those girls did to me. I hope this helps someone in some way, and if you ever see a man traveling a long distance without any luggage or briefcase at all, be wary. This happened a few months ago when I was on my way home from my boyfriend's place. I'm a small, shy, 20-year-old girl 5'2 and just barely above 100 pounds. It was around 4pm when I got on a very packed train. I could not find a seat and had to stand by the door. I held to the yellow bar connected to the glass thingy. At the next stop, more people climbed on and instead of having my back against the door, I now faced the glass part and had this skinny, tall guy, possibly late 20s, stand directly behind me. Suddenly, I felt a little bit of pressure on my butt. I inched forward filling what little space there was between myself and the person in front of me. The creep also stepped forward a bit more, pressed his hand on my butt. Being in a packed train with very little room to move elsewhere, I bit my lip and fought tears and tried to ignore the creep who was now squeezing on me. Then I made eye contact with a rather big man in his fifties and he asked, Are you alright? I shook my head, no, and the man got up, gave me a seat and grabbed the creep by the front of his shirt and yelled stuff like, can't you see she's not interested? Leave the girl alone, and slammed the creep into the handrail as the train stopped at the next platform. I never got to thank the man as he got off on that stop, and thankfully, the creep got off on the stop before mine. The day after Black Friday, I was working later than usual, because retail life. I made plans to walk home from work with my two guy friends since we all live together and work for the same company about a mile away from each other. Fortunately, I was able to get a ride from a co-worker to the train station where I was going to meet my friends, avoiding the almost mile walk to the train station through a drug-riddled and crime-heavy area. When I arrived at the station, I texted my two friends that I was there and was going to wait on the platform since I didn't want to loiter outside on the street so late at night. They said that they were finishing up and would meet me on the platform soon. Once underground on the platform, I leaned against a wall and just generally looked around and watched people, since I don't like being on my phone in very crowded places. It was past 11.30pm, but the place was still packed with Black Friday shoppers finally headed home for the day. Trains were becoming less and less frequent and I was getting a bit annoyed that my friends weren't there yet since each train was coming about 15 minutes apart. Finally, one was arriving in five minutes, and my friends texted that they were on their way and would hopefully make it to the next train. I start lining up, expecting to make the next train coming, when someone behind me put their hand on my shoulder. I turned with a smile on my face, assuming it was my friends greeting me. Wrong. It was an older man, maybe in his sixties, about three to four inches taller than me, and bulky with a scruffy beard and wearing wrinkled, neutral-toned clothes. Naturally, my smile began to slip, but he had already caught my friendly disposition and took advantage, releasing my shoulder and standing so close next to me that I took a couple of steps back from where I was starting to line up and ended up next to the wall I had originally been leaning against earlier. He reached out his hand for a shake, and on autopilot, I stuck mine out as well. He clasped my hand with both of his, all the while smiling and said, Hello, what's your name? I was caught off guard and not necessarily worried, just annoyed with myself for allowing this interaction to begin. I responded half-heartedly with, Jolene? 
he still hadn't let go of my hand. Never dropping the smile, he goes, Jolene, you're beautiful. How was your Thanksgiving? At this point, I had yanked back my hand and stuck both my hands in my front pockets of my jacket. Where I live, stuff like this occasionally happens to me, so I've become better at dealing with it and giving non-committal answers that hopefully won't encourage nor anger someone who may be unstable. I responded with a, Good, thanks, and stopped making eye contact, looking around and trying to see if I saw the train or my friends coming. Unfortunately, the man was not deterred. He started cupping my elbow in his hand, asking me more questions about where I come from, where I live, where I was going, what I was doing that day. I'm generally a nice person and don't know how to stop the conversation. I did see two guys notice what was happening, and when I made eye contact with them, they both looked away like they hadn't noticed my situation. Finally, the train was approaching. My friends hadn't made it there yet, but I didn't care. I was praying that this man was getting on the train. As it starts pulling in, the man goes, Is this your train? I tell him no, that I'm waiting for friends, which he definitely thought was probably just a line I was feeding him. But, no matter, he says. Let's take it together. Come on. The man, still holding my elbow in his hand, begins to gently tug me toward the train. I keep saying, Sorry, this is not my train. I'm waiting for my friends. This isn't my train but I'm starting to freak out because nothing like this has ever happened to me, and I'm also panicky laughing because I don't know how to get out of the situation. The train stops and the doors open. People start pouring out as people on the platform start crushing in. The man starts tugging me harder toward the open door, and I'm freaking out. At this point, I keep saying, This isn't my train! And trying to yank my arm away, but now he's gripping it. And unfathomably, I'm trying not to make a scene, I guess. Probably because I'm in shock that something like this is happening. So I'm starting to move towards the doors against my will. I'm starting to think that maybe I'll just get on the train and jump off at the next stop. I'll text my friends to meet me there. I'll pretend someone is calling me. I'll sit next to another stranger on the train. Anything. And then the greatest thing I've ever heard in my life. Jolene! My friends had arrived at the platform and saw from a distance some random stranger holding on to me. I yanked my arm away from the man who had loosened his grip when he saw that I really did have friends, and I darted to them as the stranger jumped on the train and the doors closed. As the train pulled away, my friends asked me who that man had been, and I just started crying because I had definitely almost complacently gotten on a train with a stranger because I was too scared to say no or make a scene. My initially bewildered friends gave me a hug after I told them what happened and vowed not to be late again, just as I vowed never to go to that train alone again. I am a Canadian student, early 20s, studying in the UK and am currently traveling home to see my family. I typically fly out of Manchester as it's simpler to get from northern UK to where I'm living, but I found a cheap flight that leaves early tomorrow, or today I guess, morning, that I couldn't pass up. The problem is, it takes quite a few hours to get to the airport from where I live, so I ended up having to take the train from downtown London to Gatwick Airport from 2 to 3 a.m. I waited mostly alone for an hour for my train to arrive, but about 20 minutes beforehand, a guy comes in and sits on a bench about 20 feet from me. I immediately got a bad vibe, but figured their security cameras and he was far enough away that I just forgot about it. The train arrived at 2am and the journey takes just over an hour. As it pulled up, I had this urge to walk away from this man and sit in a different compartment with more people, but when I turned to walk away, he gestured to help with my bags and I ended up getting into the compartment that pulled in front of us. There was only this man and one other in the compartment with me neither one with luggage, which struck me as odd on a train headed to the airport. One of the men was sitting a few rows in front of me, and one a few rows behind. I felt very uneasy but felt slightly trapped, so I decided to keep an eye on the man in front of me by watching his reflection in the window. He kept muttering things to himself, looking at me and smirking and had multiple short phone conversations in a hushed voice. The man behind me was doing similar things. After a few stops, another man got on who calmed my nerves, but seemed to annoy the man in front of me. 
He then moved seats to a row closer to me and now within his eye line where he pretended to read a book while staring at me intermittently over it. He was close enough now that in his next phone conversation I could make out the phrase, yeah, not now. There was one stop left before the airport and the third man got up to get ready to exit. I can't explain the feeling of fear I felt that I'd be alone in this compartment with these two men as I fumbled with my keys to get them between my fingers in the horrible case that I'd have to fight them off. The man in front of me got up again and moved behind me a row away to where the other man was sitting and I heard a faint, yeah, let's go for it. At this point, I saw my opportunity and I guess my body decided to flight rather than fight as I picked up all my bags and hauled it past the man about to get off and into the next compartment. Thankfully there were a few people there and I was able to relax. When we arrived at the airport I tried to stay with the group getting off as I knew the other two men would be exiting as well, but in my confusion, finding the way to the terminal, the man from in front of me caught up to me. I veered off over by some station employees and dawdled there while I waited for him to leave. He kept looking over at me as he paced around a bit before leaving. I watched him go up the escalator, staring at me as he ascended. I waited a minute and figured he'd given up, so I stepped onto the escalator. As soon as I reached the top, I saw the man standing there behind me, so I quickly shouted to another employee, asking him if they would show me the way to the terminal. Thankfully, it was close by and I was soon in the safety of the airport. Obviously, there is no way to know if I was just being paranoid, but I sincerely believe that there is something built into our genetics that lets us know when we are in danger. I am not typically a paranoid person and wasn't originally nervous about traveling in London alone, nor was I scared or uneasy around any of the other men I encountered tonight, but something about these guys told me to get out of there fast and I'd rather have overreacted than ended up in a dangerous situation. When I was 14, my grandfather wasn't able to take me home from the train station, so I had a 5 kilometer walk ahead of me. It was autumn and already getting dark and chilly, so I wrapped my jacket closer around my body put on my over-ear headphones and started walking. After just a few minutes, I noticed that the guy I already saw on the train was following me. I thought not much of it as I was walking in the city and there could have been a thousand reasons that this guy, mid-thirties to beginning forties, short brown hair, totally modest in appearance, was walking in the same direction. I continued walking and after some time, I was leaving the city in the direction of my little village, about one kilometer from the border of the city. As I walked past the little skate park, I began getting scared because actually at this point it was odd that he was still walking behind me. Not many people live in that direction. I walked a little faster now and pressed pause on my phone so I could hear better where the guy was. When there was about 600 meters left to my home, I started running and the man ran after me. My panic grew and as I arrived at our front yard, I hurried to get the lock of the door open. We had a huge yard and our house was on top of a little hill. The metal door was at the bottom of it. I slammed the door shut behind me and ran the rest of the way up to my home's front door. I was so relieved when I was inside that I began to cry and my grandma asked me what happened so I told her but she just waved it off. I grew up with grandparents but it wasn't the best and happiest time ever and my grandma would believe a stranger on the street more than she would believe me. I looked out the kitchen window and there he still was, standing outside the door to our yard, staring directly at me. After about 20 to 30 minutes later, he turned around and walked away. I don't know if that person wanted to prank me or if I actually escaped something worse, but luckily I never saw that man again, even though I still panic from time to time when someone walks close to me. This happened six years ago. At the time, I was 17 years old, male. I live in the biggest city of Switzerland, probably the safest country in the world, but still, this has happened. So it was a Saturday night, and a friend of mine turned 16 that day. He decided to celebrate his birthday in a well-known bar in the old town of said city. As you may not know, you're allowed to drink alcohol at the age of 16 in Switzerland, so we were having a great time that night, drinking and partying. 
My friend, whose birthday it was, got heavily drunk in no time because of all the drinks he was offered, so he decided to head home pretty early, around midnight if I remember properly. Me and two of my friends didn't want to call it a night yet and went out for a smoke on the back door of the bar. After we finished, we realized we had drunkenly shut ourselves out, so we had to go all the way around the block to enter through the front door again. As we're making our way to the entrance, more of a staggering than walking, we pass this old shady looking dude. In my drunken state, I even bumped into him with my shoulder, but carried on walking anyways. Shortly after, we hear him shouting, Foreigners, stop! And some other things I can't really remember. We were quite puzzled by his sudden rage, just stood in the middle of the walkway trying to rationalize his outburst. I mean, it was just a bump with the shoulder. I didn't even hit him hard, nor was it intended. As we were standing there, he started speed walking my direction. I assumed he's going to curse at me or whatever, but I was very wrong. He started throwing fists at me. His punches didn't hit me that hard and he wasn't even aiming for my face. I took one hard punch to the back side of my ribs though and that was when one of my friends pushed him away. I collected myself and we gathered in front of him. He was just standing there in front of us shouting that we have no respect of the elders and that he was going to kill us all. This old man was nuts and probably on drugs. As he was frantically shouting us, we realized that there was a knife in his hand. We then booked it out of that situation and back to the bar in hyperspeed, adrenaline pumping through our veins. Because of that, my drunken state suddenly cleared up and I started to feel a pulsating pain at the point he hit me. As I wanted to touch the spot, it felt wet. I took my hand out from under my shirt and saw blood, adrenaline rushing again. I didn't hesitate and took off my shirt in the middle of the bar. By the reaction of the people around me, I could tell something was wrong. They took me to the toilet where I could see it myself. I had a big wound in the back of my ribs. It was bleeding, but to my surprise, not that heavily. Still, I was in a bit of a panic and didn't know what to do. In fear of the police, as we had also smoked marijuana and I was afraid they could drug test me, I know it's stupid, we decided to head for the train station and take the first train home. Half an hour train ride later I arrived at my parents. I woke them up, telling them what happened and that I took a knife to the back. They were understandably up in no second. Only thing my father said was that he saw the wound. A band-aid will do. My mother on the other hand wasn't having any of this and drove me directly to the hospital where they saw the depth of my wound. They said I was very lucky. A little more to the right and he would have punctured my lung. Me probably drowning by my own blood. Police then came to the hospital as well and I had to give them a statement. I told them everything I could remember. I even had to go to the police station again the next day and to my surprise, they had a collage of mugshots prepared. I could identify this old guy right away. Obviously he was already registered and they even told me he stabbed another guy the same night. Shortly after, we met again in court. I can't remember what he was sentenced to. I suppose it doesn't matter because karma got him. After some time passed, two or three months or so, I received a letter explaining the death of my attacker while he was in prison. And, I suppose, I was pretty happy to hear it. This happened a few days ago and I am still pretty shaken. I visit my cousin a few towns over as she needed some help from me. I spent a rather long time here. We finished over a few hours later, but as we don't see each other that often, she wanted me to stay for a bit more, and so I did. And that bit ended up being two hours, so I left her house in the dark. Not that I minded, I have never been afraid of the dark and always carry some mace around with me, always just in case. I went to the train station and started waiting on for my train. I put on my headphones and just looked at my phone, reading through my messages and stuff like that. Suddenly I felt somebody sit next to me. It was a middle-aged man. He was bold and quite tall and skinny. I didn't pay much attention to him until he touched my shoulder and smiled at me. He started talking but as I had my headphones on, I couldn't hear him. I pulled one of my headphones out and looked at him. Excuse me? His smile widened as I had given him my attention. That smile was really disturbing from what I remember. His eyes seemed like he wanted to eat me up or something. He pulled his hand away from my shoulder and placed it near my thigh instead. I asked, 
Where was a pretty girl like you headed? I was confused. Why would he ask that? I was already ruining my mother's rule by talking to a strange man, so I wouldn't cross the line any further. I decided that I should lie. Um, I'm going to Tallinn. He smiled even wider at that. I was really starting to get nervous at that smile. Why wouldn't he stop smiling? Was the question that ran through my mind. Oh, I'm going there as well. I nodded and stayed quiet until the train arrived a few minutes later. I quickly went to the area where there were more people. I luckily didn't see him follow me. I sat down, took my phone out and started looking at random YouTube videos. I was already feeling a lot better. I stayed like this until I had to get off. I got off at my actual stop and started walking home. I was humming quietly to my songs until I felt eyes burning into my back. I turned around and there he was. That freaking creep was smiling widely at me and starting to quicken his steps. I quickly broke into a run, and I am no athlete, but I can run for a long time when needed. I could hear him talk behind me. I didn't pay much attention as the only thought running through my mind was to go. Beauty, stop running and let's have some good times. I quickly took out my mace just in case, holding it tightly in my hand. I knew I could defend myself if he had caught up with me. I already saw the town lights in the distance, and I knew if I could get there that I would be safe. I screamed out loudly when he caught up with me and grabbed my hand. I did the first thing in my mind and let him taste some of the mace. He screamed out in pain and let me go. I used that chance to run again. I was already very tired at that point, but I didn't care. I knew I had to run, and that's what I did until I got home. I broke down crying when I got home and explained everything to my parents through my tears. My mom held me and wiped my tears away, letting me stay home for a day to collect myself a bit. I can only imagine what that creep wanted to do to me, and I feel glad to still be here today. I used to ride the train to and from work. This happened on my second day of taking the train. I live at the very end of the line and a couple of the stops before mine are not in the greatest of areas, however the last two to three stops are in great areas. Usually when I get to my stop, there aren't that many people left on the train. On this day, there happened to be no one in my specific car on the train so I was content sitting all by myself. As we stop at the worst stop on the line, a large man around early thirties, six foot two, Wide and broad-shouldered, long dreads, and a very large puffy jacket got on the train. I don't pay too much attention until he sits literally right next to me. An entire empty train, and this huge dude who takes up the entire seat basically sits on top of me. He doesn't say anything to me, but then turns on some jazz music on his phone and held it up to his ear, which is right next to mine, blaring the music. I didn't want to be rude, although he was, so I decided to just act annoyed and hoped he would get the hint. He didn't. As we near the final stop, each stop before then he seems to be pushing into me more and more, pushing me against the window. Finally my stop comes and I am relieved, however he doesn't move. I look at him and say, excuse me. He replies with, do you like this tune? I said, what? And he says, this tune, this jazz, do you like it? I replied and said, Ah, uh, yeah, it's great, but excuse me, I'd like to get off the train. He then proceeds to ask me where I'm going, again not moving. I tell him I'm getting off the train and would appreciate if he would let me. He doesn't. At this point I start to get angry instead of scared, as I have a bit of a temper and say, Are you kidding me? Let me out of the freaking seat! The look in his eye terrified me. They announce in the overhead speaker that the train will be out of service for the rest of the night, at this point, the conductor starts walking through the cars to check for sleeping people. The guy looks at me and says, You're lucky this time. I wouldn't ride the train alone anymore. And I'll see you again. Don't you worry. We both get off the train and walk in the opposite direction, but I make sure to keep looking behind me while I take my mace out of my purse. I then have to walk the car ramp to my car when I see him watching me from across the street and then start following me to the elevator. Luckily, there were a few other people in the elevator and the door closed before he got there. I asked a couple of people who were getting off of my level if they would mind walking me to my car because there was a man following me. They did, 
and all was good and I didn't see him again. I bought a taser flashlight the next day. Hey friends, thanks for listening. Be sure to subscribe and click that notification bell to be alerted of all future narrations. If you got a story, be sure to submit them to my subreddit, r Let's Read Official, and give and receive feedback from the community, and maybe even hear your story featured in the next video. And join my Discord to interact with me and other listeners directly. And if you want to support me even more, grab early access to all future narrations for just $1 a month on Patreon, and maybe even pick up some Let's Read merch on Spreadshirt. Check out the Let's Read podcasts, where you can hear all these stories in long compilation form and save huge on data, located on both Spotify and Apple Podcasts. Links in the bio.